Seven-year-old Sophie Hook was camping in a tent in her uncle's yard, but when her family woke up the next morning, there was no sign of her. They frantically searched the house and the property, and having no luck locating the young girl, they called the police, but that call would be far too late. This is Monsters. Sophie Louise Hook was excited about the upcoming weekend. It was July 29, 1995, her cousin Luke's ninth birthday, and she and her family were staying at her Uncle Danny's house in Landidna, Wales, to celebrate. One of Luke's presents had been a new tent, and the adults planned to set it up in the garden so that the kids could camp out there overnight. It was a warm afternoon, and seven-year-old Sophie and the rest of her cousins spent the afternoon swimming and playing games in an inflatable pool. There was no need to worry about changing into swimsuits. All the kids stripped down to their underwear to swim. The garden was sheltered from onlookers, and the adults were always able to see what was going on. There was no reason for anybody to think that close by, another pair of eyes were watching the children play. The back of the garden ran into an overgrown bridle path, surrounded by thick hedges. From one point on the path, it was possible to look directly into the garden without being seen. While Sophie was playing, somebody was standing on the bridle path. He was noticed by several passers-by, both because he had earned a bit of a local reputation as a pervert and because he was abnormally tall. His name was Howard Hughes, but he wasn't the eccentric billionaire who built planes and made movies. No, he was a 31-year-old unemployed man who had grown up in the area. Howard had been born with a rare chromosomal condition called XYY syndrome that caused him to develop and grow much faster than his peers. By the time he was 11 years old, he was already 6 feet tall or 182 centimeters and still growing. Despite having three well-behaved older sisters, and parents who were respected in the nearby community, Howard was a poorly behaved child from the very beginning. From the day he started school in 1969, he was known as a bully, a big kid who liked to pick on people smaller than him. And because of his chromosomal disorder, most of his classmates were easy targets. Even children in the year above him were no match in a fight. As well as XYY syndrome, Howard had a range of learning disabilities that made it difficult for him to follow what the other kids were learning. That just made him more and more frustrated. When he was mad at himself for not being able to understand what was going on, he took it out on others. Howard's aggression got so bad that he was expelled from multiple different schools. Howard's father tried enrolling him in expensive private schools, hoping that the large fee would be enough incentive for the school not to give up on improving Howard's behavior. As that pattern continued, Howard's father became so fed up that he attempted to bribe the headmaster into allowing Howard to continue attending school. Despite being offered twice the normal school fees, the headmaster refused. At 10 years old, Howard began attending a boarding school for children with learning difficulties. Four years later, he was moved to a different private school. No matter how many private tutors his parents paid for, Howard's grades never improved, and he didn't gain any school qualifications. Nobody was able to make him care about anything. At 16, Howard had his first brush with the law after he strangled a seven-year-old boy to the point of unconsciousness. He had lured the boy into an abandoned house, exposed his genitals to the child, and then attacked him. Later, the boy remembered how abnormally strong Howard was, saying, quote, He picked me up off the ground and threw me down. He was a very strong man. He wound up astride me with both hands around my neck. When the boy became limp, Howard believed that he had succeeded in strangling his victim to death. However, the child had only been pretending to be dead in the hope that Howard would leave him alone. After Howard left, the boy ran to get help, and Howard was placed on probation for assault charges. Despite only giving up on the attack after the child pretended to be dead, Howard was never convicted of attempted murder or manslaughter. After the attack, Howard was placed under a supervision order for two years and committed to a Northampton psychiatric hospital under the Mental Health Act. 
After spending some time receiving treatment there, he was relocated to a more specialized hospital for offenders who were found to be mentally abnormal. Just like every intervention that had been tried while Howard was at school, none of the treatments were effective. He saw no reason to change his behavior. The only thing that he'd learned was that he should try harder to avoid getting caught. As Howard grew older, his choice of victims stayed the same. He attacked or threatened people who were younger or weaker than he was, only choosing to start fights that he knew he could win. By the time he was an adult, he was an imposing figure at 6 foot 8 inches tall or 203 centimeters. He showed a sexual preference for young children of both genders, exposing himself to and assaulting children as young as 4 years old. When Howard moved out of his mother's home and into a flat of his own, he terrorized a woman who lived next door by blasting music as loud as he could and leering at her while she was trying to sunbathe in the yard. She felt constantly unsafe at home, convinced that the next time Howard saw her, he would harm her. On at least one occasion, he made violent threats, telling the woman that he would use a gun to, quote, blow her head off. Howard found occasional work as a gardener, but spent quite a lot of his time unemployed. Outside of work, his hobbies included finding vantage points that allowed him to look inside the dorms of a nearby girls' boarding school, and standing underneath bridges so that he could look up women's skirts when they walked overhead. His entire life revolved around finding new ways to prey on children and teenage girls, and the local community quickly became aware of his behavior. Children at the nearby school called him Mad Howard. In 1987, Howard carried out another attack, the brutal sexual assault of a teenage girl, who correctly identified him as the perpetrator while reporting the crime to police. He briefly faced rape charges, but due to a lack of evidence, he was never convicted. The case was dropped and Howard continued to follow the same patterns, while his underage victim struggled to move on from the trauma and live a normal life. In 1995, Howard was once again watching underage girls. He was standing pressed up against the overgrown bushes by the bridal path. He was close enough to listen to the conversations between Sophie and her cousins, and at some stage, he heard somebody mention that the kids planned to camp out in the garden for the night in the new tent. He had become enthralled by the half-naked children, and now he'd been presented with the perfect opportunity to strike. After spending the day playing and eating barbecue for dinner, the kids had stayed up late telling ghost stories. The youngest child, Sophie's male cousin, who was six years old, got too scared by the stories and asked the adults if he could sleep inside instead of in the tent. At 12.40 a.m., Sophie's uncle checked on the remaining three children one last time. He saw Sophie tucked in and fast asleep, dressed in pink socks and a Winnie the Pooh nightgown. At 2.30 a.m., one of the cousins sharing the tent with Sophie woke up and remembered seeing Sophie still fast asleep. That was the last time that any of Sophie's family saw her alive. In the early hours of July 30th, a 55-year-old dog walker by the name of Jerry Davis had been walking his usual route from his house down to North Shore Beach. It was a peaceful morning routine taking place before 7 a.m., when very few people were out and about. Midway through his beach walk, Jerry spotted something in the distance, a white shape that he thought must be a mannequin of some sort. Unfortunately, we all know by now, it's never a mannequin. As he walked closer to the figure, his dogs began barking and pulling at the leash. Jerry realized that the white shape wasn't a mannequin at all. It was the pale, naked body of a young girl. He later described her skin as having a marble-white appearance. Jerry searched the body for signs of life, but it was clear that the girl had passed away. He quickly removed his own t-shirt, covering the girl with it like a blanket. Then, shirtless and panicking, he sprinted to a nearby phone box and called the police. At a quarter past seven, Sophie's cousins woke up for the day. When they saw that Sophie was gone, they assumed she must have gotten up early and rejoined the rest of her family in the house. Inside, Sophie's parents believed their daughter was still sleeping safely in the tent. After the other kids came inside and asked where Sophie was, the adults realized that there was no sign of her. The parents searched the house and property as quickly as they could and then called the police at 8.20 a.m. 
When police received that phone call, they immediately made a connection to the other phone call that had come in an hour earlier, the call reporting a child's body washed up on the shore of a nearby beach. By the time Sophie Hook was reported missing, she had already been found dead. Sophie's autopsy revealed the horrors that she had experienced in her final hours alive. The pathologist, Dr. Donald Waite, described Sophie's injuries as being typical of someone who had been in a fatal car crash because of the amount of force that had been applied to her small body. She was covered in bruises almost head to toe, and her ankle and arm had been broken. She had been sexually assaulted so violently that it had resulted in massive internal bleeding, and there were marks around her face consistent with being repeatedly hit in the head. There were a series of deep lacerations on Sophie's tongue and the inside of her lips. Dr. Waite reported that those marks were from Sophie's own teeth. She had been alive throughout the entire attack and had bitten down on her lip and tongue due to the amount of pain she was experiencing. Ultimately, Sophie's blunt force trauma and internal bleeding had not been fatal. Instead, once the attack was over, her murderer had strangled her to death. Dr. Wade estimated that the strangulation process would have lasted for several minutes. After Sophie died, the killer had tried to dispose of her body by dropping it in the ocean, hoping that the water would wash away any forensic evidence. Despite extensively searching the area, the pink socks, undergarments, and Winnie the Pooh nightdress that Sophie had been wearing at the time of her abduction were not located. That led investigators to believe that the killer may have kept them as a trophy or disposed of them in a separate location. Local witnesses were quick to come forward about the man they had seen lurking around the bridal path close to where Sophie and her cousins had been playing. At six foot eight inches, Howard Hughes was distinctive, and he had a well-known reputation for being a creep. One female witness said that she'd seen Howard trying to hide in the hedges. When she asked him what he was doing, he responded that he had dropped some money and was searching for it. Investigators went to the location where Howard had been seen and found that it was so close to the garden that somebody standing there would have been able to see and hear the children. If Howard had been eavesdropping, it would have been easy for him to discover that Sophie and her cousins were sleeping in a tent overnight. Although it has never been confirmed, investigators believe that, after Howard stopped watching Sophie and her cousins, he attempted to abduct a different child. A six-year-old girl playing at a nearby park had been approached by a man matching Howard's description, but when he tried to grab her, the girl ran away and told her parents. With Howard's criminal history, including raping a 14-year-old girl and multiple accusations of assaulting even younger girls, investigators were sure that they had found the perpetrator. That theory was only strengthened by the realization that Howard had been approached by a local police officer at 2.55 a.m., the same morning that Sophie's body was found. That same day, police detained Howard for questioning. The investigation into Sophie's death was led by Detective Superintendent Eric Jones. Jones made a media statement saying, quote, Whoever was responsible for this crime is a very dangerous man, a brute who must be caught quickly. Just as Jones promised, the investigation moved at almost unbelievable speed. The predator who had made such a brazen attack was likely to strike again, and the North Wales police were determined to apprehend him before that happened. Although there was no forensic evidence that directly linked Howard to Sophie's death, there was an abundance of circumstantial evidence, including multiple credible witnesses who placed Howard at the scene of the crime. One man reported seeing Howard walking along the road carrying a large sack on the night Sophie disappeared. When police make an arrest based on only circumstantial evidence, the decision is almost always controversial and risky. Despite being certain that Howard was the murderer, police were unable to hold him for any longer than four days. They didn't have sufficient evidence to arrest him. Howard was promptly rearrested after a search of the house he shared with his mother revealed that he was in possession of child pornography. Less than a day after his second arrest, Howard Hughes was charged with Sophie Hook's abduction, rape, and murder. Jerry Davies, the dog walker who had found Sophie's body, hadn't planned on attending her funeral, but when her grieving parents asked him to attend, he didn't want to say no. At the service, each mourner was given a small booklet that contained a collection of photos of Sophie. Jerry opened the booklet and looked at the first photo. Then, for the first time since he'd discovered her body, he broke down in tears. 
The trial began in June of 1996. The prosecution was still lacking forensic evidence, so the outcome of the trial hinged on witness testimony as well as the strong circumstantial evidence tying Howard to Sophie's death. One of the witnesses, and probably the most crucial of them all, was Howard's father, Gerald Hughes. Gerald had made the difficult decision to testify against his youngest child because he believed, without a doubt, that Howard had killed Sophie. Gerald spoke to the court about a conversation he'd had with his son, where Howard confessed that he'd been the one to kill the young girl. At the time that the conversation took place, Howard had already been arrested and had undergone four days of police questioning, during which he had not confessed to the crime. Gerald had gone to visit his son at the police station, reportedly telling him, quote, If I'm going to stay in this room, I need to know whether you did it or not. Allegedly, Howard pulled his father to the side out of earshot of the officers and then replied, quote, I did it, Dad. I must tell someone. According to Gerald, Howard then went on to give further details, telling him that he watched Sophie in the garden during the afternoon of July 29th and had returned to abduct her at around 2 a.m. He denied having carried or forced Sophie out of the tent, insisting that he'd been able to persuade the girl to come to the beach with him. After that, Harold told his father that Sophie had started screaming, forcing him to cover her mouth until she was silent. Then he stripped her naked and threw her into the sea. Nowhere in this story did Howard account for the vicious sexual assault that Sophie had suffered, or the severe injuries that had been inflicted on her. To this day, Howard has continued to insist that his father was lying during his testimony, and that the conversation Gerald remembers never happened. Jonathan Carroll, the witness who had seen Howard carrying a sack down the road on the night Sophie died, had also agreed to testify for the prosecution. He told the court that he had been able to get a glimpse of the sack's contents and believed that he saw a naked human body inside it. Jonathan's testimony was viewed as incredibly reliable because he had made a great sacrifice in order to come forth about what he saw. The reason Jonathan had been in the area that night was because he was committing his own crime, robbing a nearby house. He had decided that he needed to follow his own moral code and provide testimony that would help put a little girl's murderer behind bars, even if it meant spending time in jail himself. In fact, Jonathan was in the middle of serving his sentence for burglary at the time he testified. The third key witness had not been present on the night that Sophie died. Instead, he had come to testify about a conversation he had with Howard several years before. Like Jonathan Carroll, Michael Weedy was also a convict. He had been arrested for child sex offenses. Michael testified that Howard had told him in detail about a specific fantasy he had, abducting and sexually assaulting a little girl around four or five years old. Howard said that he'd prefer to kill his victim either by stabbing her or strangling her to death, with the latter being the way that Sophie had been killed. Prosecutor Gerald Elias discussed that alleged conversation, saying, quote, it was, if you like, a fantasy of Howard's which, horrifically, he was able to bring to reality. He had boasted in the past of his liking for girls of four or five and his wish to abduct, sexually assault, and murder a young girl. Elias described Sophie's final day alive, telling the jury that she and her cousins had a barbecue dinner and spent the evening playing charades and telling ghost stories. Then he explained, quote, but during that night, Sophie was removed from the tent, taken from the garden, and subjected to the most appalling violent physical and sexual assault. She was then manually strangled and her body thrown in the nearby sea. These atrocities were of such wickedness and depravity that they almost defy belief. The jury listened to detailed descriptions of the injuries Sophie had suffered. The sexual assault, which had caused both anal and vaginal injuries, the broken arm, which was believed to have been deliberately broken by her attacker, and the multitude of bruises found on her body. The prosecutor emphasized that Sophie hadn't just been murdered, she had endured minutes or even hours of suffering before she was eventually strangled. Her killer had either not cared that she was in pain or had made every effort to inflict pain during the attack. On July 18, 1996, the jury reached their decision after deliberating for only six hours. Howard Hughes was found guilty of kidnapping, assaulting, and murdering Sophie Hook. During Howard's sentencing, Justice Richard Curtis addressed him directly, saying, quote, 
You are a fiend. Your crime is every parent's worst nightmare come to pass. No girl is or ever will be safe from you. My recommendation in view of your appalling crime and the maximum danger you pose to girls is that you are never ever released. Justice Curtis sentenced Howard to three life sentences, one for each charge against him. Before being led away from the courtroom, Howard turned to the press gallery and mouthed the words, quote, I didn't do it. He later tried to appeal his sentence on the grounds of alleged physical and sexual abuse he had suffered while staying at Bren Esten, a care home for adolescents during his own childhood. While Bren Esten was the center of a major child abuse scandal, the Court of Appeal ruled that there was no reason for Howard's convictions to be quashed. After Howard appealed a second time, the judge ruled that Howard would be forbidden from contesting his convictions again in the future unless any new information came to light. With Howard facing a minimum sentence of 50 years and Judge Curtis's recommendation that he never be released from jail, one question remained. Could his crimes have been prevented? For years, local police had been aware of the man that local school children had nicknamed Mad Howard. He had been notorious since he was just a young boy. By the time he was a legal adult, Howard had collected 17 convictions for a range of different crimes, and in the years before Sophie's murder, he had been interviewed by police for five separate allegations relating to harm of young children. Howard had a documented history of peeping Tom behavior and had been arrested for multiple assaults of young children in the past. He was suspected to have carried out numerous other attacks, which never made it as far as the police station. His previous victims had been as young as four years old, but the worst consequence he had faced before Sophie's murder was two years of court-ordered supervision. In some cases, such as the rape of a teenage girl which he had briefly been charged with, the case had been thrown out due to lack of evidence. In others, the parents of Howard's traumatized victims hadn't wanted their children to go through the stress of testifying in court. Detective Superintendent Jones, the man who led the investigation since the day of Sophie's murder, believed that nothing else could have been done to prevent Howard from killing. He believed that law enforcement had done as much as possible to monitor Howard and prevent him from reoffending. In his opinion, justice had been served. He said, quote, Everything that could have been done was done. But months later, the Home Office stated that they were considering enforcing closer supervision for criminals who had carried out sexual offenses against children. Ultimately, Howard's collection of non-fatal attacks on young children hadn't been enough to put him behind bars at all. He had only been imprisoned after he finally succeeded in killing one of his victims, which he had been trying to do for years. Although being arrested for Sophie's murder prevented him from reoffending, he left a trail of traumatized young children behind him, and Sophie Hook, at only seven years old, had to pay the ultimate price for Howard's freedom. Sophie's family continues to live with a sense of guilt for not being able to protect Sophie from Howard Hughes. They had supervised the children playing in the garden that day and left the patio door open all night so that the kids could come inside if they needed to, but it hadn't been enough to save Sophie. Her mother, Julie, stated, quote, I protected my children so much. They were not allowed to cross the road on their own. We both feel very, very sorry that the one time she needed us most, we were simply not there for her. That feeling will never go away. Howard Hughes ended a young girl's life and destroyed a family, like only a true monster could. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org.
Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.